do this without notes, you know, tucked away someplace. But today in our midst also, special at Hamlin University, and I feel specially privileged to meet her, is Dr. Kendra Smith. Uh, Kendra, would you stand? Her husband is Dr. Houston Smith, the famous theologian. And uh, she and her husband have had an impact on the wonderful speaker you heard last night, Dr. Joe Wimora. Because I didn't realize this, they were in Denver, Colorado, when um, Joe was there. So you never know how many lives are touched and how many new friends you make in doing something that you think is right. The way I'd like to proceed this afternoon is to introduce each person, and then we will allow them to have about five minutes to six minutes. And if I look a little nervous, you know that you're going over time, because we want to keep you on schedule, and uh, you all have agendas after. Sitting right next to me is Ruth Tambara. Ruth, of course, is known in our community to some of us, very active in the Japanese uh, American society, but also very instrumental in why uh, WCA work in St. Paul, perhaps not in Minneapolis. Uh, but I got to know Ruth a few years ago when I did my first Japanese American course. She has quite a story to tell. She will probably be sharing some of this. She has done a lot of speaking, but when I contacted her, a lot of people say, you know, I did all this speaking before, but I'm not so sure that I can do it now. But I think you can always do it once you do it. I hope anyway. Uh, Ruth has helped many Japanese Americans and many, many other foreigners, and she will share some reflections. Now, when I first met Joel Thorstenson, of course, he was a professor that my husband admired since Aug my husband went to Augsburg. And uh, Joel, you may not remember, but the first year I met my husband, you were leading an economic seminar on sociology or racism that I participated in. Um, yeah. And Joel said many times in our conversation, he's a professor who's just retired, Professor Emer Emeriti from uh, Augsburg in the Department of Sociology. Joe said to me one day, he said, you know, I belong to the Rainbow Club. And I said, Rainbow Club? What's that? And he said, well, that was where we had Japanese Americans, blacks, and all these other people. Those were the good old days when we did a lot of communicating. Those were the early 50s, late 40s. Um, and he has had contact with a man who most of you, or several of you might know, the Great Father Dai, Episcopalian Japanese-American minister. I never had a chance to meet him. My husband did, and Joe and others in this room had a lot of contact with him. And Joe will, of course, reflect on how, as a Caucasian, he had encounter and interaction with some Japanese-Americans. And I think I'd like to share with you in my research that I found that the Lutherans, the Episcopalians, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Quakers did a tremendous amount of work in many known ways and untold ways. And so I think all of us do pay credit to that, although we may not verbalize each particular group. And of course, many groups in the community, hence the name of the, pan the title of the panel is Community Response. And I suppose our great lesson from studying or discussing this is, if it does happen again, would we respond? And as May Harder so eloquently put it, one person, two persons responding, that goes a long way. It's infectious. And so we come to the third panelist. Maria is an Augsburg graduate, again, just by chance, at her home at dinner, I happened to say, I think I'm going to have a conference on this topic. And she began to bubble and say, yes, we remember the Nisei boys. Our church did this. Our church did that with them. And my mind clicked. I said, 
will you be on the panel? Oh, no, I don't think I can say anything. <laughs> but I convinced her and her daughter, who is here. I think, where is Karen? She teaches Japanese at Augsburg College, a Yale graduate. Uh, Karen said, twist her arm and she'll be on it. And so here she is. She'll share with us what, as a young person, the church did. And now we come to Ed Nakasoni. He's also known as Bud Nakasoni. Teaches at Lakeland College in history. Bud came here from Hawaii. He has a story also to tell, but in the Japanese language intelligence camp at Fort Snelling. Some of you may or may not know this. And Bud has some reflections, particularly coming from Hawaii to some places which he'll talk about, and then coming to Minnesota. He liked it so much that he married a Minnesotan. Mary is his wife sitting there next to my husband. And his son, Paul, was the one who was at the panel symposium this morning. Ed has been a great supporter of these kind of conferences that I've tried to put together. And I was a little nervous on Monday, I think I called you, Bud, and I said, you know, I hope people come. I, I wonder if it'll go. Don't worry, Kim Ken, it'll go. Thank you for your confidence, Bud. And now, Kay. Kay, I met a few months ago, and immediately we clicked. And she began to tell me of her work here as she came with foreign students. Again, the Rainbow Club, Joel. Kay was involved, Kay Kashino. She is with Burgess. She was with Burgess. She tells me she's just retired. She's going to enjoy this freedom of doing what she wants. But we all know that we really don't retire when we retire, do we? But Kay also had experience in the camps. Her particular camp was in Wyoming, quite different. We've been talking about, you know, Minidoka, Arkansas, and others last night, but this is Wyoming. And so, without much ado, I think I'd like to start with Bud, and then we will move on as I sort of call your names. But I'll give you the mic here that we have to speak into. This is, this is fine, thinking. And for the recording. So you can speak into that. As Professor Jensen has indicated, I do come from Hawaii, and in fact, I love it so much that I go back every year taking a class, an Asian American class. We go out on the 13th of December again and come back on the 22nd. Uh, I'd like to talk about this from the perspective of a person from Hawaii and what I experienced and what most of us experienced coming here to Minnesota. I would like to just backtrack a moment because I think this might be important. Uh, those of you who are interested in finding out a little bit more about this uh, CWRIC redress issue, all those things, if I were you, I'd urge your librarian to get copies or to even uh, enroll uh, uh, and get the Pacific Citizen. The Pacific Citizen is the ethnic Japanese American newspaper that comes out weekly and it, they have a fine coverage of all of these things and if you want to know what's going on in the Japanese American world the Pacific Citizen would have most of that. I'd also like to mention the fact that I think not too many of us are aware that uh, there were people incarcerated in Hawaii also as many as 1500 and as indicated earlier, as far as those who were incarcerated or those who were picked up by the FBI, we too in Hawaii had a very active FBI. And they did have a black list, a gray list, and a white list. And those who were on the black list or the gray list were summarily picked up. My father was picked up and was brought into questioning after one day one day of intensive grilling, he was released as being non-harmful. Uh, you might be aware that they were also very suspect of the Kibei, K-I-B-E-I. These are Japanese people or those of American citizens born here who were sent overseas back to Japan to be educated there and then came back in their later years to America, the United States. They were highly suspect. Many of them were incarcerated. 
Japanese language teachers, as indicated earlier, were picked up very quickly. I remember my principal, Mr. Hino, being picked up the, the same day, December 7th. Japanese martial arts instructors were picked up in Hawaii. Japanese Chamber of Commerce officers were picked up. Those who entertained the visiting naval personnel occasionally would have Japanese ships come into Honolulu Harbor. And of course you would have a regular presentation and regular party for these people by the Japanese community. Well, those who headed those committees were picked up. Many of them had all their rights taken away and were incarcerated, first on Sand Island, which is right outside of Honolulu, and then from there, many of them, without any notice to their families, were then moved to the mainland, to places like North Dakota, to places like Texas, places like Tennessee. And these were camps that were not the regular camps that the regular Japanese American and Issei Nisei people who were incarcerated in the 10 Japanese American camps here in the mainland. Well, despite all of this, the atmosphere was different as far as Hawaii was concerned. I think we had a very understanding military commander there, General Emmons, Delosi Emmons. He was literally ordered to make up a plan to round up all 160,000 plus Japanese Issei and Nisei and be prepared to ship them either to one of the islands on, Oa on, on Hawaii or to move them on to the mainland. Of course, this did not work out. And he was one of those that held back on that plan. Fortunately for us, this made us available for defense work on the islands, to continue on with our regular lives, and then as the years went, months went, and by February 43, when the call went out for people to volunteer to go into combat in Europe with the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, where they wanted 2,500, they had 12,000 or so volunteer in Hawaii because they wanted to do their bit, and as I said, the atmosphere is completely different. By the time 1945 came for me, I was an 18-year-old young man who had been imbued with this idea that we must do all for our country, etc. Fortunately for us, because we were second generation Nisei, in order to communicate with our parents, we needed to speak the Japanese language. And having had the opportunity, our parents sent us to the Japanese language schools after the public schools were over six days a week, it made us be relatively familiar, I say relatively, familiar with the Japanese language. And as we were inducted, because by 1945 the draft was reopened to us, and as we were inducted, we had people, Nisei soldiers, who had come down from Fort Snelling, and they asked us, please read this. And they had the simple I, E, U, A, O, and all those things. And naturally, I was very adept at that and said, go through that door, okay? <laughs> and so that's how I was set up to go to the mainland. And having been a young, idealistic, dreamy fellow who wanted to hit the mainland, because after all, Hawaii was just a rustic little island in those days, it was my dream to come to the mainland. And so here was the opportunity. And so I did not fail on that. Well, we were sent, all 300 of us of Japanese descent, were sent to Fort McClellan, Alabama. Well, in those days, in late 45, it was a matter of Jim Crowism and all those things being very, very strict. And they didn't know what to do with us. They finally told us, if you want to be treated like a white man, go to the white man's exits and entrances, taxi stands, bus lines, all those things. We followed the army orders and that was, that was the way it was. But we knew we were coming to Fort Snelling. 
We had had word already through the natural grapevine that occurs in situations of this nature that Minnesota was a far more liberal place than Alabama. And lo and behold, I got here in a dead of winter. <laughs> if I recall correctly, it was Christmas of 45. And we landed here at uh, Fort Snelling, Minnesota. But sure enough, as it turned out, the climate was cold and everything was very, very uh, demanding. But the people who were here, I say this very sincerely, were as warm hearted as could be. I recall very fondly to this day, every Saturday, Saturday night, there was a dance over at the YWCA and it was especially for the Nisei soldiers and Nisei personnel and it really opened up our hearts. I remember going to a dance, and that building is still there. It's run by the mineralogy, uh, mineralogical uh, department right now. It was the old field house, and we had dances there. We had University of Minnesota students come out there, and there I met young people who were very, very gracious to us, kindly to us, and I recall very much how one young lady said, I would like you to come down and visit my parents. I said, oh, no, 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 not me, because after all, don't you realize I'm of Japanese descent? We just finished the war, the Great War, and so on. I don't think your parents are going to approve of you being with a Japanese person. And I said, oh, nonsense, all right? And so I recall having said yes and going for Thanksgiving all the way down to Fairmont, Minnesota. I remember going to picnics, powwows, Stillwater, Acacia, right here with, across the Mendota Bridge. I remember the dummy line going up through post uh, Fort Snelling. Then the Minnehaha line, all those things. And people were just as gracious as can be. Of course, I remember the May 15th snow of 1946 also. <laughs> that really astounded me. All right. And so... I believe that almost all people who have had this experience coming from Hawaii have a very, very warm feeling for Minnesota and the upper Midwest. I remember going to Fort, now Fort McCoy, then Camp McCoy, and where the original 100th Infantry Boys went through there, and they were very, very impressed with the liberality and open-heartedness open -heartedness of the people of Sparta and Tomo, Wisconsin, and there's a big plaque there in one of the parks there in Sparta, sent over by the 100th Infantry Veterans Club. I remember the 1946 polio scare. Remember that? And we were already, we had moved the whole school, the Military Intelligence Service Language School, which is now the Defense Language Institute. We moved that whole school from Fort Snelling out to Presidio Monterey. And even as we were putting that place into shape, the call came out that Minnesota was in trouble. And you know, we organized committees to send contributions back. And I remember receiving a letter from Governor Thai thanking us for that effort. So I guess my reasons for wanting to come back to Minnesota have always been one of being with people who have been friendly, kindly, open-hearted, and... Uh, I may be effusive at this, at this point, but at any rate, that's the way I feel. And you kind of look around. Look at all the Korean orphans that we have here and adoptees. Look around some more and look at all the mongs that we have opened our hearts to. And so it is, as May Hara said this morning, extend your hand, hand, and I think you'll find that Minnesota has done a great share of that. Thank you. I'll move next now to Maria, since you talked about the Saturday night dances. Um, Maria probably may know of it, but then I think Ruth can probably talk more. She whispered to me, I chaperone those dances. <laughs> <laughs> Maria? Would you move the mic? So oh, that, sure. No, so that other one no, too, so that oh. we can get it in the video. No, no the other one. one. This one? Yeah, speaking. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just recently, a young man in my son's circle of friends, uh, he's a young Japanese-American, married a pretty little uh, blonde, curly-haired girl 
a German Scandinavian descent from southwestern Minnesota. And the wedding took place in a little Lutheran church way out in the country. Right away, the cautious mother in me said, they're really setting the stage for a lot of culture conflict, aren't they? And my son replied, oh, mother, Phil's folks have been here for three generations. They're just as American as we are. And his mother makes the best apple pie. <laughs> this incident was brought to mind as I was thinking back across 40 years to that March of 1942 when thousands of our fellow Americans of Japanese descent were so cruelly evicted from their established homes and businesses. And they were placed in these detention camps out in the middle of nowhere. At that time, I was a student here at Augsburg College, and incidentally, Dr. Chorsonson here was one of my teachers. Uh, I was also an active member of St. John's Lutheran Church on 49th and Nicollet. At that time, the, f uh, the plight of our fellow Americans seemed rather far away. It was something that happened to other people. And uh, I didn't realize at the time that I was soon to meet up with that problem face to face through my church. I was a member of the Miriam Girls. It was a young, a young women's missionary society. And uh, we had been together as a group since confirmation days. And we were about 32 girls who met once a month at members' homes. We had a dinner meeting and devotions and some sort of missionary program. At that time, we were all in our early 20s. Our pastor, the Reverend Lyle C. Burns, believed that in order for an organization to really be vital and active, uh, it had to be involved in something greater than itself, had to be interested in doing things for others in order to grow and, and remain vital. Uh, and he often came to our meetings with suggestions as to how we could do things as an expression of our faith. And he would always help us to spend our money. And he said that would keep us healthy if we kept doing things for others. And he always managed to keep us in a healthy glow. <laughs> for example, there was a struggling mission that needed uh, altar vases for their church. Well, we provided them. He had another idea. Uh, the missionaries in these far-flung places uh, should be kept in touch with home. And it would be a good idea to send magazine subscriptions to them. So pretty soon, Time, Life, Ladies Home Journal, Jack and Jill, and Better Homes and Gardens were on their way to Africa. So it really was no surprise to us when one, at one meeting he asked us if we would like to furnish a room at the Japanese hostel. Now, Miss Martha Acard was a missionary to Japan, and I believe that she was called back uh, because of the war. And in 1942, she was listed in the yearbook of the Lutheran Church in America, at that time the United Lutheran Church, as uh, having a, in a Japanese address. In 1943, she had uh, an address in Tennessee. And in 1944 and 45, her address was here on Clifton Avenue at the site of the Japanese hostel. And she was called by the Board of Missions to take charge of the hostel. She knew the language and understood the people very well. So um, it was to that big old house on Clifton, the house with many bedrooms, that many Japanese came from the detention camps they came to uh, find work, and as soon as they were able to support themselves, they left and made room for someone else. So um, they, they soon became assimilated in the community, too. We'd see them around at different functions. And my husband remembers a very popular young Japanese 
a man who joined the choir at Grace University Lutheran Church and was a very active member there. And remembering what the good book said about loving God above all things and your neighbor as yourself, my group, uh, the group of girls I belonged to, divided up into committees so we could go to work on that bedroom. And I remember a group of us spent a Saturday afternoon painting the walls a light green. Then we went downtown and bought some tie-back curtains and a scatter rug and one of those chenille bedspreads, if you remember, and a lamp and a dresser scarf. And soon we thought we had a very uh, cozy bedroom. The furniture was already there, evidently contributed by some other good Lutherans. On the day that we delivered the things to the hostel uh, and put them all in, uh, we brought um, a potluck supper with us, and we shared it with the residents. And we had a really a fun evening. And as I remember, we were met at the door by Miss Martha Akerd. Now, most of the residents there seem to be more on the young side. But I do remember an old Japanese grandmother. She had a shawl around her shoulders and was sitting in a rocking chair. And she was rocking and smiling back and forth and just beaming her approval on the whole scene. And somehow, I'd like to think that the one who said, I was a stranger and you took me in, was smiling too. Thank you, Maria. That was beautiful. <clears throat> I'd like to move now to Ruth Tambara. Ruth, as I indicated, has a lot of things to share with us, and perhaps she can share some as we move along. Dr. Jensen <clears throat> and friends. Over 41 years ago, my husband and I, both Nisei, we were living in Berkeley, California. He was a native son of the Golden State of California, and I was an Oregonian. Early in January of 1942, I attended some of the Tolan hearings in San Francisco. These were the government-sponsored meetings to see if there was a possibility that people would have to be evacuated. I remember the Japanese Americans as being a very young, naive group. We were in our late 20s or early 30s. Compared to the Italian Americans and the German Americans who were attending the same hearings, <clears throat> the Italian Mer Americans explained to me they would never evacuate them. We could move voluntarily on 48 hours notice if we would go 150 miles inland. So <clears throat> my husband and I and family decided to move to a friend's farm in Reedley, California, and that's near Fresno. With the help of our Caucasian friends, we moved, rented our home, stored our household goods, closed our businesses, settled all our household accounts, within that 48-hour period. After being in Reedley about five months and just beginning to learn about farming with the help of the United States Department of Agriculture, we were ordered to move again to relocation centers. We had planned to go to relocation centers with our families. However, during the registration process, my husband and I were given an option by <coughs> the uh, Provo Marshal of the military order. It just so happened that we thought we were doing something terribly wrong because he was going to register in one uh, for one relocation center and I would go to the other and we thought, well, we'll choose which one we like the best. But then <clears throat> that was uh, when I went down to the office, I found that this Provo Marshal was a high school classmate of mine and he said that he had our records uh, cleared through the FBI, and if we would like to go voluntarily to the eastern or midwestern part of the United States, we could go to any city 
and help build community acceptance and help resettle the people from the relocation centers. The sociologists, many of them from the University of California and from Washington, they studied this whole situation over and they did not want another reservation problem. We were planning to go to Lincoln, Nebraska since my husband had an offer of a teaching position, but the chief of police in Lincoln warned us not to come since he was of German extraction and for it was not safe even for him to be there during the war. So through family friends we, who offered us a home, we arrived in St. Paul in August of 1942. It was a real hot summer, humid just like the one we had. We had letters of introduction and references to various organizations, churches, YWYM, the International Institute, and colleges. I had been on the staff of the Portland YWCA after I finished Oregon State University. Each week, my husband and I would go to different groups in St. Paul and give talks on Japanese Americans. Sometimes the weather was 26 degrees below zero, and we didn't have a car, and there were no buses at that time. We traveled by trolley. <clears throat> there were only about 10 Japanese living in St. Paul before the war. So many Minnesotans were not acquainted with the American citizens of Japanese extraction. Many families and students wrote to us from relocation centers wanting to resettle here. So we started to make contacts with the colleges and places of employment. Many were very highly skilled in their professions as auto mechanics, cooks, dentists, doctors, nurses, dressmakers, and teachers. We were, <clears throat> then we had to start, um, we started to help by opening our small home to the families and students, but the numbers increased beyond our expectations, so it was necessary to form the St. Paul Resettlement Committee, composed of social workers, church leaders, college faculty members, and community people. So an organized resettlement program was started. In St. Paul, the committee leased a hotel located where now the new Civic Center is, stands, and Mrs. Tomiko Ogata was a director. She managed the housing and prepared the meals for the families who came directly from the different centers and also advised them about making adjustments and living in win the, through the winters in Minnesota. In this way, housing and employment and, and the immediate needs were met. I was on the staff of the St. Paul YWC at the time, and many girls were going to school and needed board and room. So through the YW, a committee was formed and helped establish standards for household employees, defining their responsibilities in the home, their work hours, salaries, free time, and also found homes for, who were seeking helpers. The committee members would, go, uh, would contact the families and these homes and help with the interviews and worked out uh, the details of household employment. In addition to the resettlement committee, the St. Paul Council of Human Relations was formed to help not only the Japanese Americans but other minority groups. Mr. Warren Berger, now Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, was the first chairman. He was an outstanding attorney and he wrote our articles of incorporation. Dr. Charles Turk was president of McAllister College, and he at one time, and uh, Bishop Emeritus Philip McNary of St. Mark's Mina uh, Church uh, in Minneapolis, uh, was the um, minister of the Christ Church in St. Paul during those years. One time he asked if there were specific problems of our group, and I explained we need to find a barber so the men folks could get a haircut. Some of the barbers turned down the Japanese American students. We also needed to find employment for trained beauticians. So Reverend McNary expressed this need in his sermon and found members of his church who offered to open their shops for these services. Though we did have some problems in finding housing and employment, Minnesota was outstanding in accepting the group. The private colleges and the universities opened their doors to the students who applied. Hospitals accepted internships for the medical students. Some were at the top of their classes at the University of California in Berkeley. 
And as uh, Dr. Nakasone said, the weather was true, truly cold in Minnesota, especially after living in sunny California. But the hearts of the people were warm and gracious. Many opened their homes and churches welcomed them to help make their adjustments in their religious and social life. We were, we were <clears throat> in communication with friends from other cities who had uh, resettled there, and Minnesota was outstanding in accepting the group. After the war, many resettled people moved back to the West Coast to be with their families and businesses. But many stayed in Minnesota and became longtime residents and are participating and contrib contributing to the life in the community. Personally, evacuation was a tragic experience, a lot of sadness and bitterness, and I sincerely hope it will never be repeated to any group. In retrospect, we were part of a huge human drama where there was no script because it was unprecedented to have compulsory mass migration in the United States. The majority were citizens, <clears throat> and many of the, our parents had lived here 70 and 80 years. There was no time for dress rehearsal. Everything was trial and error, and the villain was race prejudice, fear, war hysteria, intolerance, and discrimination. The scenes were endless, and now after 41 years, the curtain goes up on the final act. We must remember the United States was founded on the premise that individuals of differing races, religious beliefs, and cultural patterns could live together harmoniously and could create a strong, just, and tolerant nation. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. I'd like to move to Joel now. Um, Joel, if you will talk into both mics. Uh, one for recording and one for hearing. Thank you so much, Ruth. That's a hard act to follow, a beautiful statement of Americana at its best. One of the first students I had in my classes when I began teaching history at this college was a refugee from the horrors of the Holocaust in Germany. And he wrote one of his papers to try to describe how it happened that Germany could produce a Nazi debacle such as had happened in his country. He called his paper Counting on the Forgetfulness of the People. And it seems to me that that is something that this conference is addressing today, that if we forget our history, we may be doomed to repeat it. And so I'd like to begin by commending Dr. Kin Kin Jensen and all the people who have helped her to put this conference together. We have an important period of that human drama that you alluded to played, played out here in Minnesota, here in the Twin Cities. And uh, I think it's important for us to remember that the climate, the social climate in these parts of America were not all that warm uh, in the 30s. I believe it was Kerry McWilliams who once wrote that uh, Minneapolis was the capital of anti-Semitism in this country. And I am old enough to remember some of the indignities, the unbelievable indignities that occurred in the relationships between the races in this city. Time will not allow any, any more, more reflections on that. But it seems to me that it is helpful to and encouraging to note that by the next, within the next two decades, the social climate in Minneapolis had become as warm as a summer sun in June. I'm not alluding to the, the, the rest of the summer heat. <clears throat> and it seems to me that uh, a part of the explanation for that changing of that social climate was the model role played out by the Japanese American community in our midst. I could, of course, single out others. I came to know very intimately some leaders of the Jewish Community Council 
who have been so active in, in, in this kind of work. But today I'd like to pay attention to my connections, to my lucky contacts with the Japanese American Community Center, the Japanese, community, commun uh, Japanese American community. The person that uh, brought me into those intimate contacts, uh, me and Fran and, uh, and the rest of our family, was Father Dai. Perhaps uh, he's had more influence on in my life than I'll even understand, but I count him as one of the most remarkable people that I've ever known. A scholar, a thoughtful, insightful student of human relations, a theologian and a clergyman, a devout person in the Episcopal Church, a, a remarkably able leader of human relations, capable of bringing together leaders of the church, leaders of the community. He became a member of the Mayor's Council and Com Commission on Human Relations. He was uh, widely, uh, he was on the constant speaking circuit, helped organize innumerable conferences on human relations, and had a breadth uh, in his approach and understanding both of the historical and sociological and psychological dimensions of human relations and a firm commitment to the moral theological premises of the Judeo-Christian heritage. A warm person, a friendly person. He, uh, he, I suppose in a way that he assumed the role in Minneapolis that you assumed in St. Paul. Uh, was a leader of the Japanese American Community Center, which became a veritable human relations uh, meeting place for the most diverse groups that I suppose that ever assembled in the Twin Cities. Out of that Japanese American Community Center so emerged the uh, Rainbow Club, which I think must certainly be rated as the most interethnic, interracial, ecumenical social assembly, social organization that has ever been present and active in the Twin Cities. I remember once we engaged the, the river boat down the Mississippi and uh, we had a visiting professor from Norway here, professor of philosophy, and uh, I said, you should come along with us and see how human relations operate in the Twin Cities. And uh, he just shook his head. He couldn't believe it. Uh, I think he had uh, read some things about some of the very nasty things that Americans had been up to throughout the hundreds of years of its uh, history. Um, well, these were some of the most uh, tr treasured ex experiences uh, of our life, that we could bring our family to the Rainbow Club meetings, and every month uh, there was a Sunday afternoon gathering at the Japanese American Community Center, which became a place for us to meet uh, people from virtually every background in the Twin Cities, all of them committed to, the, to implementing the American dream and the best values of our Judeo-Christian heritage. And so um, today I just like to say that I am very grateful for the uh, contributions of the Japanese American community that have come to this place and helped us work out a social climate in which better human relations can flourish in the future. Let us not forget our history. Thank you, Joe. I'd like to move very quickly now to our last participant here, Kay Kashino, and you spoke about the Rainbow Club, and Kay can pick up from there. I'll bring the mic over. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Can you all hear me? I don't have a very loud voice, so <laughs> I'll get here yet. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you as a member of this panel. 
I'm afraid that my address this afternoon will probably be the shortest one on record since I'm totally unprepared to make a, uh, make a delivery of, of any kind. I've had some uh, personal uh, things uh, confronting me at home. I have a granddaughter getting married, and I've been very deeply involved in the wedding plans, and so I really didn't have time to make a um, formal we presentation. Worry, we'll take you in <laughs> so I'm just going to hit some of the highlights. I think most of you have heard what happened uh, to um, uh, the Nisei, the Sansei, and the is Issei in the evacuation experience. It's been covered by previous members on the panel and this morning and uh, probably yesterday too. So I won't go into detail except to say that uh, we were given anywhere from three days to maybe two weeks in order to prepare for this uh, evacuation process. And of course we were allowed to leave with only one suitcase per person. And in that one suitcase we were, uh, we were to take all of our personal belongings, whatever we could carry, plus uh, sheets and pillow slips and so forth. The, the Army provided us with cots at our uh, destination. And um, my first stop was at Santa Anita, where I lived in the stables that someone else mentioned earlier today. And then I was there for five months, and then we were uh, transferred to Heart Mountain, Wyoming. And I don't believe anyone's mentioned anything about Heart Mountain, but it's uh, probably one of the most desolate areas in the country. It was filled with um, uh, mesquite and... Um, wild uh, rattlesnakes and rabbits and so forth. And when we first uh, got there by train, the train stopped for a few, uh, for a couple of hours, and all we could see were little chimneys coming out of the uh, ground. And I, my heart just sank because I thought, my gosh, they're going to put us underground. And it really bothered me. Well, it, as it turned out, they had built barrack type uh, buildings for us to live in so um, they transported us by car and it wasn't so bad after all although we called them tar paper shacks and uh, they were just uh, uh, just lumber covered with tar paper and in the winter time when the weather got to 45 below zero uh, we could see this the um, ice coming in through the cracks in the in the you know in the boards and we sometimes wake up in the morning with our eyes closed because we couldn't open them they were just frozen shut um, well I'll sort of pass over the evacuation itself and I'd like to tell you more about my uh, my visit here my uh, coming to Minneapolis I left camp in May of 1945, and that's a long time ago. And to us, in, I was born and raised in California, and in, in California, May is a relatively warm month. When I arrived here, it was still snowing, and I was just desolate because I thought, my goodness, it must be a, a country of eternal snow <laughs> and wind and everything else. Well, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Um, when we first came to Minneapolis, we were um, given jobs by the War Relocation Authority. And I had a job with the State Highway Department. And um, the people there were very, very good to me. And I made friends very quickly. And everybody was very kind. And it was one of those places where I think uh, I, still rem I, I still remember as being one of the nicest places I've ever worked. The people were very cordial and very receptive. and. Um, Later on, uh, I transferred because the distance between where I lived in Minneapolis to Midway, where the State Highway Department was located, was a little bit too far. It was an hour in transit both ways, so I uh, found a job in, um, in the city of Minneapolis. And I worked first for a publishing firm. And, um, oh, I forgot to tell you that when I was in Heart Mountain, I worked under Bill Hosokawa. And uh, some of you may remember him as the... Um, uh, one of the uh, executive editors of the Denver Post who was just recently retired, but he has he is responsible have, for having written three very good books on the evacuation experience, and I think um, some of us who are here can can give you an idea as to what books they are if you're interested. They 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 cover the evacuation very well, and he's 
he's written very well because he has a very good journalistic um, background. Well, when we first came here, I was at Miss Acard's. I think somebody mentioned Miss Acard's hostel, and it was just a scramble to find a place to live because at that time, housing was very scarce, and most of us um, came uh, fresh out of camp with nothing and no experience and being br brought back into the uh, mainstream of, of uh, living was a little bit traumatic for all of us. Well, we finally found a small apartment and I had uh, three children, so it was necessary that I, found, I find a place that had at least two bedrooms in it. Uh, the rooms were very small and I was very fortunate because I was working and uh, and my sister was in town, so she would look after the children while I went to work. And it was, you know, it was, um, we were able to handle the situation quite well. And I worked with the uh, publishing firm for about six years, and I transferred to another job. I think um, in the 40-some-odd years that I've been here, why I've had about three jobs. And my last was with a... Um, college textbook publishing company. I was an acquisitions editor and it gave me an opportunity to meet a lot of people and uh, visit campuses all around the country. It entailed quite a bit of travel, so it was very interesting. But uh, I, I would like to say that in every one of these uh, different arrangements, the people on the staff were very, very good to me and uh, they helped me a lot. I was very new to everything. I was glad that I had some journalistic experience and that my uh, major at school was also journalism, so it helped a lot. But um, Thank you. that's about it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think what I'd like to do in view of the time is open it up to the floor, and if you would like to address questions to any of the panel, I will uh, repeat the question. But uh, we have here amongst us some people who've had experiences with the relocation. I'd like to sort of formally introduce to the audience uh, Mr. Carl Namura, Vice President from Honeywell is here. He's uh, been sharing some of his experiences, I think, with uh, Dr. Paul Murphy before. Mrs. Murphy is here, Dr. Nathalie. So if any of you have questions, uh, take your chance, and then perhaps I will sort of throw out some teasers before we quit at 2 o'clock. Anyone have a question? Uh, <laughs> do I see some hands? Okay. All right, Don? I'll repeat the question, Don. It did come up this morning. It was addressed. The question was, uh, any reaction to the redress issue, the compensation, uh, if any of the panelists uh, felt so inclined? Because if it did come up, would the question be raised with regard to the American Indian? Anyone care to comment uh, on that? But. I think one of the basic uh, issues here would be the idea that the individual rights of these people were desecrated, were taken away. Uh, often you will also hear the argument that, uh, well, we had uh, Pearl Harbor occur against us. We had uh, the Bataan March occur against us. Uh, what about our prisoners of war and so on? But one must keep in mind that we're talking about Japanese Americans who are Americans and to have their own government take away their rights to that extent without 
any reason whatsoever except for the hysteria that been caused by the coming of war, by political pressure, economic pressures, and let's call it basically racism. To that extent, then, I say that we are different. Japanese-American situation is far different and that you have a demand for compensation which is minimal at the least, at the best, and you have the reason that these people are saying, let us have an open acknowledgement by the government that it was wrong to put Americans behind the prison, behind the prison bars. And as far as the redress monetary issue is concerned, I would like to pass that by as far as what is right and what is wrong. And so Japanese Americans feel that they should be compensated something in regard for that. Open beyond that, many Japanese Americans feel that this is a national issue, and sometimes even worth an international issue, in the sense that we should let the people know, and as has been mentioned often, let us not history repeat itself again. And as a result, Japanese Americans also point out that you've already had precedent in the sense that the Vietnam veterans, or Vietnam people who were dissidents, they took it to court, they were compensated, something like $1,500, some were in prison for as little as one or two days. In direct contrast, Japanese Americans for the most part were in a greater number of months, years, and so on. So, I guess my retort would be something to the extent that the individual rights of these peoples were taken away. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nathalon, would you have any comments? This is a public policy issue. I know that you had some thoughts on it. Would you like to share some thoughts? We have a mic here if you'd like to use it. I didn't really come prepared to make a statement on this, but uh, I find myself uh, very much moved by this discussion because um, it really brings, uh, I think, into focus uh, a basic problem that we as a democracy face. face. Um, there are the two sides, I believe, in our national life. Uh, there's a side that I think we're mostly aware of most of the time, the side of uh, decency, fairness, equality, democracy, all the things that uh, have tended to make America what we want it to be. At the same time, uh, our national history has had uh, moments of uh, clearly a, a downside in which intolerance, the discrimination, a competition among our various groups that have made up this nation uh, have given us uh, a much different kind of uh, a coloration to ourselves and to the world. And I think uh, the story of America is the struggle between these two tendencies, uh, that when uh, we are able to mobilize our energies in behalf of our highest traditions, our positive uh, energies, uh, we are a nation that is unparalleled in the world. Uh, when we permit uh, the pettiness, the smallness, when we permit uh, prejudice and intolerance to take the upper hand, uh, we are a danger not only to ourselves but to the entire world. It's a lesson that uh, we should have learned uh, very clearly back in those days of the relocation. I find it hard uh, to really fully understand this or to take it in or to believe it somehow. I was an adult at that time, and I don't remember exactly what I was thinking or saying or doing, but I suppose, uh, Joel, I was like everybody else, just swept along, that it was wartime, and we needed to do what we needed to do, unthinking. And maybe this reflected uh, a prejudice that uh, we were not prepared to admit to ourselves, at least in those days. I think it's unquestionable that <clears throat> this did reflect the prejudice and the discrimination that people regarded as different from us, 
whatever that might mean. Uh, I have the feeling, uh, and I know this is widely shared by everybody here, that uh, it's a constant process of learning. But this is the meaning of democracy. It's a constant process of coming to understand the pluralistic character of this nation and the pluralistic character of the world. Uh, we are a world of different people, of different styles, different intentions, different aspirations, different appearances, different uh, national origins and national backgrounds, different religions, and uh, the future belongs to those who are able to understand that these differences uh, need to be understood and even cherished, and uh, that we have to find a way to uh, build institutions that surmount these differences. It's a fundamental lesson that uh, I hope we've learned something from. Uh, how much we've learned, I think, is what we're here to try to find out. Uh, I don't think we've learned as much as we should, but maybe we've learned some thing. And I certainly hope with all of you that this lesson <clears throat> that we should have been taught by this ghastly experience that will uh, serve us uh, throughout the rest of our history in a constructive way. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really would like to end on this high note if anyone else doesn't have a question. I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that there's a wonderful Japanese scroll of the 12th, 13th century out in the lobby before you go, owned by one of our professors. There are some books that I've put on display, some of the books that have been mentioned. Bill Hosokawa's book, Quiet Nisei, uh, which is a word that is often used about some of our Nisei here. Uh, Mishi, uh, another author, has The Years of Infamy is out there, The Great Betrayal by two American scholars uh, whose fathers were great historians. If this conference has done anything for you, uh, Maybe it's nudged for the older of you some consciousness, for the younger some consciousness raising some of my students here, for many students who were at the convocation and for last night. It's been an uplifting experience. I could hardly sleep last night. And Dr. Kendra Smith asked me, how can you top last night? I don't know, Kendra, if I topped it, but I hope we've all shared in this. And as I close, Nothing like this occurs in our family without the support of my husband. I'd like to give him credit. Thank you all for coming. I know you have other agendas. Thanks for your support. If we have a conference again, I hope you do come. Thank you all my participants. Very well.